I'm, uh, I'm Josh Borisov, uh, Vice President of HipShop Products. And um, you know, I help run the day-to-day. -day. Um, it's a collaboration between all of us, really, here at the shop. Um, we have about 35 employees. And um, you know, I run it with my dad. And uh, he started it in uh, 1982, about a year before I was born. And so, you know, I grew up in the company. I've always been here as long as I can remember. I've been playing guitar since I was like eight. And um, yeah, and it's, uh, so it's running the day-to-day -day is really what I do. Hipshot gets its name from the Hipshot string bender system. Uh, it's a, my dad's first invention. And uh, I'll take you through the history of that briefly. So Gene Parsons and Clarence White uh, of the birds came up with this idea to bend a string to get tele uh, to get uh, like uh, pedal steel type tones being able to bend a string with um, by actuating a lever on the strap here allows you to get sort of like a kind of country western type of tone that um, that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise other if you were to try to bend above the string which you it's hard to do on a stage type of environment especially considering you only have two arms so um their system required a lot of routing of the back though you can see how there's this enormous plate here we make this for gene parsons now um and uh and so you know routing out the instrument it's a it's a big investment um to try to have to do that so my dad came up with the hip shot string bending system and he just called it the bender the hip shot string bender and what it is is it just mounts on the back of the instrument using the existing strap buttons so there's really no additional work you have to do to the instrument to mount this plate here. You feed the strings back to a mechanism here and you actuate it with your hip on this lever. So this one's on the G string. And that's why we call it hip shot. So the robot that we that we purchased from Adaptech is a robot that is used to polish uh, parts for bass guitars, um, the tuning machines, primarily the actual buttons that you would tune, um, the the, um, the keys. So it's using those to uh, it's polishing those with uh, on a on a buffing wall. I originally called it the bass detuner. <clears throat> and uh, soon after I invented the uh, string bender, the string bender has a little attachment that drops the low E to D. I was playing in a band and the bass player was looking at the, uh, the B bender and noticed the low E to D and said, wow, it'd be sure nice to have one on my bass. So a, a week later, I uh, made this little gadget and some, this is called the detuner. And it uh, made out of some of the same components that the uh, that uh, B vendor is made out of. This lever is the same lever, so I was able to save some uh, money in producing it. Uh, I didn't think this was going to be very popular, so I put it on the back page of our little brochure that we printed up, thinking it'd get buried. Uh, went to a um, a, a base uh, seminar type of thing and showed it around and I met Jocko Pastorius, who was a great bass player, and Billy Sheen. And Billy Sheen said, I'd really like to have one of these, Buddy Brunel. And so I gave a few out and uh, Billy Sheen ran with it and made it, and Buddy Brunel ran with it and made it very popular and became the number one seller. And here it is. It's, all it does is it drops the low E down to D. You flip it back up, you get back up to E. Very simple. And uh, it's become part of the vocabulary of uh, rock and roll. We've had a lot of demand for our tuning keys. A lot of folks have wanted them. We haven't been able to provide them fast enough for them. So we've been working very hard to build up our capacity. One of the areas that we were having problems with was one of the components of our base tuning machine, the, the key. And uh, we just couldn't get them uh, produced fast enough. We, it was really the polishing stage that was the problem, getting them to look beautiful and uh, worthy of an instrument that someone would build out of love and care. So we, uh, 
we kept working at it. We tried a whole bunch of different things, um, high energy tumbling to try to get a nice finish. We tried uh, chemical etching to try to get a nice finish. Uh, we just None of them could really compare with the finish you get when you press a key against a high speed wheel, um, when, you, when you polish it with a cloth. We're looking to have this robot help our staff to do a lot of the mundane, difficult, dangerous work um, that, that people really aren't built to do and that people don't really want to do. So the hope of the robot is to, is to get us to the point where we can take all of the dangerous, uh, difficult, mundane, tedious work out of production and let our people focus on doing the stuff that people are good at doing, making decisions and, uh, and, and operating the equipment. Um, a lot of the buffers who, we, like one of the buffers who's currently was buffing and actually polishing is now running that robot. Uh, we brought our staff in early. We uh, told them, hey, we're getting a robot and we want your input. And you know they were very happy to provide that. A lot of them had a lot of really great suggestions. And uh, even when we got the robot on the floor, we started looking at their mode of polishing manually and seeing how we could translate that over to polishing on a robot. There's a lot of things that don't translate, but there's a lot of things that do. And we had to relearn how to polish these things because there's a, a, a lot of elements that a person would just not even think about on a, on a buffing wheel that the robot doesn't think at all because it doesn't think. So uh, getting that to translate was, was a lot of work and the whole team came together and really helped us with it. So there, there's always that stigma, I think, whenever new technology comes in, that people are worried that their jobs will get lost. Uh, but you know, this technology is not that different from like the CNC re revolution or other things. You know, it's still it's it's eliminating man operations, but we still have, at least in our operation, we still need the people. The robot can't operate by itself. And I think having that idea that in an, a situation where you're looking at an aesthetic part that a person has to view as beautiful. Uh, in spite of how it changes coming in, like there's the, there's product variants coming into the robot. Uh, having someone be able to judge whether or not that part is good, needs rework, retouching, things like that, that's, I don't think that's ever going to go away unless we get some astronomical level of automation going, and it's not worth it. So having people supervising the robot is crucial because it doesn't do any thinking for itself. It, it needs us. So we, we did a lot of shopping around for different brands uh, of, uh, of robot, as well as different integrators. And Adaptech really appealed to us because uh, they were willing to let us take a really deep role into building this robot and integrating it. There's not a lot of examples to, to go off of. Even our, our uh, abrasive supplier, the people who provide us with the wheels and ver various other components for the buffing, don't have a lot of experience with robot polishing cells. So uh, we had to kind of invent a lot of it. And we're very happy that Adaptech was able to uh, and willing to come in and let, let us come in and really take a front row seat or, and really take, get our hands dirty helping. A lot of other integrators weren't necessarily willing to, to let us come in. They just wanted to provide us with a solution. We would sign and then walk away with it. But there's really, that wouldn't work for us. So. We came in, we actually designed the, uh, the parts, uh, parts that Adaptech ended up taking our drawings and integrating them into the robot for us because we had a pretty strong idea of how we wanted to get it done. Adaptech came in and was a lot more of a partner than just a vendor. You know, they, uh, they worked with us, we worked together, they helped train us. Um, and when we realized that things maybe needed tweaking, Adaptech was there to help us fix those things. I originally came on with the intention of growing the company um, from a marketing standpoint. And uh, I quickly realized that we just weren't producing enough product. People already loved the product. The product was really good and we had a very strong backing of a lot of amazing artists and a lot of amazing builders who already wanted the product. We just couldn't provide it fast enough. So that was the beginning of our dive into automation and to improving the internal systems. Um, a lot of what we've done up until, you know, about 10 years ago was strictly producing new product. 
producing new inventions, um, expanding the world of guitar uh, through new patents and new intellectual property. Uh, but automation and that, that side of it is really important for being able to provide and capitalize on the things you've already invented and continuing to allow more people to have it. It's, uh, it's really cool to invent something, um, and then it's really even cooler to share it with the world. And so automation allows us to take our ideas and to push them out to the audience, the people who can use them, and people who can make amazing music and inspire people.